Dear students, good day. Glad to meet again with this lecture in this semester. Today we will cover a group of genetic skin diseases uh, that are uh, classified into three main categories, chromosomal skin diseases, single gene related skin diseases, and polygenetic skin diseases. Examples of these uh, diseases are uh, epidermolysis bullosa, ichthyosis, palmoplantar keratoderma, neurofibromatosis, xeroderma pigmentosum, etc. In this lecture, I will cover the most important and prominent ones, except ichthyosis, because it is already covered by another respected colleague in an entire lecture. Epidermolysis pollusa is a group of mechanobullous disorder. What we mean by mechanobullous, this means that a bulli will be formed through a simple uh, mechanical trauma to the skin. And these group are due to more than 20 different mutations. But the main mutation affects two parts of the cell, which are keratin and collagen. These defects lead to prevention of proper anchoring and attachment of the skin cells. And this leads to a bulli formation after a simple trauma because the attachment between the cells will be disrupted. This disruption leads to a space cause accumulation of fluid and eventually a blister will be formed. There are four major subgroups within epidermolysis bullosa. These are epidermolysis bullosa simplex, junctional epidermolysis bullosa, dystrophic epidermolysis bullosa, and there are a new category called Kindler syndrome. How we divide these diseases, we are dividing them depending on the level of disruption and level of the bulli formation. The most superficial one is epidermolysis bullosa simplex, where the bulli formed at the level of the epidermis. That is the most superficial layer of the skin. The second one, junctional epidermolysis bullosa, the bulli are at the level of the basement membrane. That's why it's named junctional. So it's at the level of the junction between the epidermis and the dermis. The third one is dystrophic epidermolysis bullosa, and it is at the level of the dermis while it's attaching to the basement membrane. So it is between the basement membrane and uh, dermis. Epidermolysis bullosa simplex. This condition is autosomal dominant. The prevalence is 1 to 2 in 100,000. And it's most common among this group. Uh, fortunately, it is mild disease because the level of the blister formations are, is very superficial. It heals without scarring. And the second one is junctional epidermolysis bullosa, and it is due to autosomal recessive gene defects. The mutation is in the gene named laminin 5 and lead to separation between the dermis and epidermis. So this gene is responsible for the proper development of laminin 5, which is uh, in charge of a uh, proper attachment between the epidermis and the dermis. Usually the death happens before the second birthday of the baby. There will be other parts in the body that are affected by this pathology. Airway, so the child face uh, laryngeal edema, recurrent striders, and he is at risk of asphyxia at any time. There will be many oral lesions, leads to uh, improper feeding difficulty, 
in nutrition, um, malnutrition, uh, improper uh, immune status, uh, recurrent sepsis, and colonization of the skin at the size of skin disruptions due to bullae formation. Dystrophic epidermolysis bullosa. This type is seen by the people work in anesthesia because of the recurrent need for intubation and asphyxia. The prevalence is less than 1 in 100,000 and the defect is at the level of the basement membrane and dermis and the mutation is in the gene responsible for the development of collagen 7. We have two forms autosomal recessive, which is more common, and autosomal dominant. Coming to another group, we are now leaving the epidemiolysis bullosa group of diseases, coming to the genetic keratinization disorders. There are a group of different skin diseases which are due to inherited abnormality in keratinization. So, we know that the process of keratin metabolism is a complex process and there are certain genetic disorders lead to improper keratin metabolism. We know that in normal epidermis, where the keratinocyte develops, it will develop or burn in the basal cell layer or stratum basale, this in the epidermis. The process of terminal differentiation and cornification is uh, involved the, uh, a journey that will make the keratinocyte passes upward through the levels or the uh, layers of the epidermis going until it ends in the stratum corneum it will lose its nuclei and cornified and become a dead layer. So there are different syndromes related to this abnormal keratinization, among which ichthyosis is the most prevalent one. That's why in our department we decided to cover it in a separate lecture. So Leaving ichthyosis group of diseases in the uh, genetic keratinization disorders, going to neurofibromatosis. This is a relatively common disorder, affects one person in 3,000, and it is inherited as autosomal dominant trait. There are two types, neurofibromatosis 1 and neurofibromatosis 2. The other names are for one is von Ricklings Hansen neurofibromatosis, and the second is bilateral acoustic neurofibromatosis. Usually, type 1 covers more than 85% of all cases of neurofibromatosis. And the second type is phenotypically and genetically distinct from the first type. In neurofibromatosis 1, we have the following features. One, we have to have six or more cafe au lait patches. What is cafe au lait patches? It is light brown oval macules, usually developing in the first year of life. So it is very early sign of the disease. Second, we have axillary freckling in two thirds of the affected individuals. Third, variable numbers of skin neurofibromas. Some small and superficial, others are large and deep. Most of them are dome-shaped nodules and they are firm. Some are soft and compressible. Through, you can compress the nodule uh, through the, a defect or a hole in the dermis. So you can push it down and this is a sign called button hole sign. Others, uh, you can feel it as a knotty or wormy. So it is firm. 
it is not compressible and they are variable in the uh, size as well. Neurofibromas may not appear until puberty and become more in number and in size with age. Fourth criteria is small circular pigmented hamartomas of the iris. We call it leash nodules. This is appear early in childhood. Nearly all neurofibromatosis type 1 patients meet the criteria for the diagnosis by the age of 8 and all shows the criteria of the disease by age of 20. The usual order of appearance of the clinical features is cafeolase. So in sequence, the earlier signs are first of all is cafeolate macules, axillary freckles, leash nodules of the iris, and neurofibromas. The second disease within this group is tuberous sclerosis. This is inherited as an autosomal dominant trait with variable expressivity even within the same family. So some of the family members, all family members will have it because it is autosomal dominant trait, but with variable severity. Some have mild signs and symptoms, other more severe, more systems involved, uh, poor prognosis, less life expectancy. Clinical features of tuberous sclerosis, the skin changes include the following. Small oval white patches, which called ash leaf macules, occur in 80% of those affected. These are important as they may be the only manifestation at birth. So these white oval macules happens in 80% and it's called ash leaf and usually could be the only sign at birth. Adenoma sebaceum, over 85% of those affected. These are duvelops at puberty. They are pinkish yellowish in color. It look like acne on the face and they are concentrated in the central part around the nose, central part of the face. Subangual fibromas, which is, happens in 50%, half of the cases may have subangual fibromas. These are sausage-like projections from the nail protrudes from the nail folds. And uh, this is uh, seen in adults usually, not in children. Connective tissue nevi or chagrin patch. These patches seen on the lower part of the back of the patients in less than half of the patients. And the surface of these patches are like cobblestone, like uh, stones uh, close to each other. It is not uh, totally flat. And uh, it's uh, uh, yellowish in color. Other features in tuberous sclerosis, epilepsy in more than 75%, mental retardation in 50%, uh, ocular sign include retinal phacomas and pigmentary abnormalities in 50% of the patients. Also, they may have hyperplastic gums. The gums are enlarged and hypertrophied. Zero dermapigmentosum, another condition. Uh, this is also a heterogeneous group of diseases characterized by defective repair of DNA uh, as they are damaged by the ultraviolet or sun exposure because we know that ultraviolet radiation is one of the components of the sun rays. So patients develop, uh, have born with this genetic disease, they may have a big difficulty while they are exposed to sun rays because genetically they have a defect in the repair of DNA produced by ultraviolet light.
the skin is normal at birth uh, later on they may develop very early freckles roughness and keratosis on the skin exposed to sun and this is developed between the age of six months to two years they have photosensitivity increase thereafter there will be Uh, facial skin uh, shows atrophy, telangiectasia, because it, the th skin becomes very thin, because the skin is unable to repair itself after damage, the DNA repair will be defected in this disease. They may even have small angiomas. We know that the all skin cancers and neoplasms are related strongly to the sun exposure in particularly to ultraviolet component of the sun rays. So all types of skin cancer are prevalent among this group of patients. Basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, uh, malignant melanoma, and even precancerous conditions like keratoacanthoma. Many patients die before the age of 20 years. Eye problems are common due to photosensitivity. They, have, they will have photophobia, conjunctivitis, and ectropia. Also, this condition may be associated with microcephaly, mental deficiency, dwarfism, deafness, and ataxia. In xeroderma pigmentosum, there are obvious freckling at the neck, and sometimes when we see uh, the patient for the first time, we may notice certain scarring, many spots scarring on the nose or the face or other parts that are exposed to sun. These scars are signs of removal of uh, skin cancer lesions. The last condition within this group that will be covered by our lecture is keratosis pilaris. It is very common condition. It is inherited as autosomal dominant in childhood. The peak of incidence is seen at puberty. And this condition leads to keratinous plug at the follicular orifices. We know that both the hair follicle and sebaceous gland have one unit called pilosebaceous unit and they share one orifice called pilosebaceous orifice or follicular orifice. And uh, that's related to hair follicle. So there will be also perifollicular erythema. Some kinds of inflammation and redness may be seen. What about the clinical features of this condition? The lesions appear as small gray or white plugs of keratin that are obstruct the mouth of the follicles. And they are entrapping the hair. The site of predilection of this condition is usually the extensor surface of the extremities, arms, legs, thighs, buttock, and even sometimes on the cheeks. We see that the surface of the skin become rough because of these uh, follicular plugging, and some redness is seen as well. Some follicles are spared totally, while the adjacent may be affected. Uh, severely without uh, an apparent cause. Nobody knows why some follicles are spared from this condition. We have a sign called antenna sign when there are, if we see the lesions in good lighting, we may have, uh, we may see a, a strands of keratin protruding through the follicular orifices. Uh, that's why we call it antenna sign. Treatment of keratosis pilaris includes, uh, usually it clears up on its own, on a slow pace. But many people or even parents of the children with keratosis pilaris uh, wish to have accelerated uh, healing of these lesions and they are annoyed by it. So they seek dermatological uh, consultation and help. To speed the process of healing, then we have many methods and we have to concentrate or 
on two things exfoliation of these thick keratin that occlude the orifices of the follicles and moisturize and anti using some kind of soothing and anti inflammatory uh, topical applications to soothe and uh, heal the redness and erythema of the skin. So the treatments include lactic acid lotions which reduce their roughness because it acts as a keratolytic agent and soften these tiny plugs. Alpha hydroxy acid, glycolic acid, all these again, all acids act as a keratolytic agent and reduce scaling and helps skin return to its normal uh, smooth and moisture. Udia creams also moisturize, soften the skin, help to loosen the dead cells. Salicylic acid lotion again. So as you notice, all are acids, but it should be mild and with low concentration because if it's in high concentration, it causes more erythema and agitation of the skin. Topical corticosteroid reduce itching and inflammation. Topical retinoid because retinoids are uh, regulating the uh, keratinization process, so it promotes cell turnover, prevent hair follicles from plugging. We can take months to see any improvement, and the tiny bumps almost always come back once stopping treatment. The condition it improves by itself with age towards adulthood. The peak severity is either in childhood or in adolescence. So even if, leave, if you leave the condition without treatment, it will heal. But as I said, many people or their children's parents of the patients of keratosis pilaris wish, wish to have accelerated healing and improvement of the skin uh, texture and appearance. And thank you very much.